Hi friends and welcome to the By Faith Podcast. My name is Christine Hoover and I'm so glad you're here. This season on By Faith, we are talking about the ins and outs of vocational ministry. Friends, we are getting closer and closer to the release of my new book for pastor's wives called How to Thrive as a Pastor's Wife. I am so excited to get this resource in your hands. I believe that every pastor's wife is a faithful servant and a leader in her own right. If you are a pastor's wife, I want you to know that you have great influence on your church, your community, your family, and your husband, and I know you find joy in seeing God move in the lives of others. But here's the thing. I also know that you face unique challenges that too often go unnoticed and unaddressed. At times, you may feel that you can't talk about your struggles, even with those who are closest to you, which can leave you feeling alone, depleted, and misunderstood. I have been there, and I believe that God has more for you and for me. And that's why I wrote this book. I wanted to come alongside you as an understanding friend, one who offers encouragement and guidance, but also who gives you truth and practical tools for cultivating a meaningful personal relationship with God, your husband, children, church, community, and other women. Relationships that will sustain you and help you thrive. Friends, I'm currently working on a few corresponding resources that we'll release along with the book. So if this is a book that resonates with you, please head over to my website, howtothriveasapastorswife.com. You can pre-order the book. You can send a link as a hint for your Christmas list, or you can enter your details letting me know that you want a reminder when the book comes out. I will put a link to all of that in the show notes where you can easily find it. Okay, guys, let's get to the show for today. My guest is Amy Patrick. Amy is a single mom to four kids, and she was previously a pastor's wife. You may recognize her name because she was married to Darren Patrick until his death in May 2020. Amy joins me to tell her story, and then she shares with us the lessons she's learned, and some of them have been through, and some of them have obviously come through difficult things and excruciating pain. She shares lessons with us about the importance of emotional and relational health for leaders. Friends, I think this is one of the most significant conversations I have had on By Faith, and I encourage you to listen to it with your spouse, and then more importantly, to put some of Amy's suggestions into practice. So here, friends, is my conversation with Amy Patrick. Welcome, Amy, to By Faith. I'm so glad to have you back. Thank you so much for having me. I'm I'm honored to get to talk to you today. Well, we spoke probably two years ago, right before COVID came about. I think it was right before then. I don't even remember. Time has worked now, but um, we were talked about emotional health then, and we're going to talk about emotional health today again. And I'm just really, really privileged to get to have you on the podcast. So for anybody who doesn't know you, would you introduce yourself and tell us about your family? Sure. Um, I would love to. Yes. So um, I have four children. They are um, ranging from 21 down to 12. So I've got college students and middle schoolers and high schoolers and all those things going on. Some of you may know who I am because I was married to Darren Patrick, um, who was a pastor for a number of years. Um, and had a a fairly public story. Um, You know, he was an author, wrote a lot about our church planning experience, um, and was fairly prominent, you know, in the ministry world. And then part of our story is that he was fired from the church that we planted in 2016, really just kind of had a personal implosion. And then, you know, tragically uh, passed away. His death was ruled a suicide in, in 2020, which what has been extraordinarily traumatic, caught us completely off guard. Um, just, you know, a really, really horrible, uh, terrible thing. I'm sure I don't have to say that, but that's kind of what, you know, we've been living for the last year and a half or so. And so, you know, kind of navigating a new world in a lot of ways for me, you know, as a single parent, um, as a single woman, ministry in a different space, all kinds of, of new, new things, um, that I've been navigating over the last year and a half. Yes. A lot, a lot. Mm -hmm. Do you say it was ruled a suicide? Do you, do you believe that it was, or you don't believe that it was, you know, I mean, you know, when you get, you know, a a horrible report that you have to read through that kind of outlines, you know, how they come to these kinds of, you know, conclusions, you have to look facts in the face, you know, and I, um, so we've done that. And I think we are at peace with that. I, 
there's still a lot of mystery, you know, around his death for myself and our kids. There's, there's mystery that we've just had to accept there in not, in not being able to know, you know, there are, there are ways that I can kind of look at his story and even, you know, what was happening around the time of his death and say, I, I can see how that could have happened. And there are other ways that I look at the story and I say, I just can't, I can't fathom it at all. Mm. And, you know, I say that as somebody who had had lived with Darren, obviously through, I mean, I had seen him suicidal, you know, in 2016 and, and knew what that looked like in some form. And so I'd certainly been very attuned to his, you know, emotional health and overall well being. But, you know, there is just anytime something like this happens, there's an irrationality about it. You know, if someone takes their own life, it's not a rational act. And so, you know, sometimes I think we try to come up with a rational explanation for something that isn't rational. People aren't in a rational place, you know, when they, when they make that, when they, when that happens, when we have experienced that kind of tragedy. And so we've had to settle with some level of mystery, um, I would say, um, and some level of acceptance with that, which I think that a lot of our faith is mysterious um, Mm. for sure. And so there, there are pieces of that, that I think will remain a mystery for us. Uh Uh-huh. I'm glad that you mentioned that word mystery because I that's what I imagine as I prepare to speak to you that there's just so much unknown. There's so much tension that you live with. And I don't even know how you begin to do that. So can you speak to that? How have you learned to acknowledge the mystery and embrace it somewhat when I, if, if it was me, I would just constantly be pressing against that saying, surely I can figure it out. And I'm asking this because we, as Christians, you just said, there's mystery to the Christian life. So how have you learned, what can we learn from you about acknowledging painful situations and lamenting them and embracing them without sometimes having answers? Yeah. Well, I think we just, you know, in our humanness, we have a bent towards wanting clarity. You know, we want, we think clarity is the answer. Um, a lot yeah. of times if we can just get clarity and really, if, if we can just understand it cognitively, then, you know, that's the way forward. And I think, you know, what God wants to give us rather than clarity many times is he wants to give us himself and to experience him, you know, in the midst of not having that kind of clarity. And so, you know, I think there is an, an acceptance and an intentional stopping of the just constant looking and searching and wondering and ruminating and speculating um, that I can do because it's a dead end to me. I, these are not things that I will, mm. I will know um, in this life. So I could spend my life doing that or I could press into Christ, you know, and his relationship with me and the mystery of the faith that is there and, and know him really more deeply in that, um, than I ever could, I think with, with more clear answers. What comes to mind is sometimes that doesn't seem enough. And I don't know if right. you've ever felt that I'm sure you have, but just, yes, he's trying to give us himself, but sometimes that's not enough. I want to know the answer. Yes. Yes. And so I think it's new ways. I think it's in some ways it's experiencing God in, in ways that we haven't before and, and maybe ways that we would not, you know, most of us, I would say, do I, do we have to meet God in grief? Can, can we, can we meet him somewhere else? Can we yeah. meet him in a happier place? Right. <laughs> does, it, does, it, does it have to be in grief and in, in suffering? Um, and you know, that there's mystery in that as well, but he shows up, you know, he shows up and, and it's not maybe always in the ways that we would prefer or, or how, what we would expect, but I can testify that he is there and that he is present and that I have certainly experienced him in different and deeper ways, you know, than, than I have before. Mm-hmm. I'd like to know about that. I'd like to, you know, it was May, 2020 when Darren died. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Can you, can you give us an idea of what that process of grief has looked like for you? Yeah. So, I mean, Grief is incredibly messy is, is one of the main things that I would say about it. It is not linear. We can try to put it in boxes and stages and steps, and it, it tends to break all those rules. Mm, (laughs) Uh, It looks very different for people. You know, I've talked to um, a number of people who are in a grieving process in, in some way, some similar to mine, some others. And you know, there are things that I have found helpful that they have not found helpful at all. And, and vice versa, there were things that that were suggested to me that I thought that sounds terrible. Like that doesn't sound, you know, helpful at all. And so, 
it's, it's just not a nice, neat process. There's a lot of waves and layers to it. It catches you off guard. And, you know, I think in the, the really tricky thing is that in the midst of grief, you're still having to attend to the daily things of life, you know, like just people still have to eat and bills need to be paid and things need to be taken care of. And, you know, in the process of that, I'm also attending to my children's grief. And so mm-hmm. We certainly had help. Um, we all had a we all had a counselor um, almost from the get go, so that you know there was someone else that we could all be talking to other than me. Although we have a lot of conversations about grief and sadness and all the emotions that we're experiencing, you know, in our house and in our family. But I strongly recommend help in some kind. I know counseling isn't an option for everyone, but if you can get into a grief recovery group or even just have someone who's walked that road ahead of you, you know, to walk with you, I certainly recommend getting help, but it is Mm -hmm. grief is it's, I mean, it sounds so basic to say that it is incredibly difficult. It is, but it's also, it's just a tricky thing. You know, it's, it's hard to put it in a box. And I know that we want to a lot of times because we want rules for helping people and we want rules for what it looks like because it's easier to predict that way. But I think part of being with people in grief who are grieving involves just taking what comes as it comes. Yeah. And I would think also you want a finish line. You want to know, okay, when do I, when do I know that this is done? And there is no finish line. I would imagine. I mean, I would write, I'm I'm wondering where you, how you would describe where you are now about 18 months in like, where are you now? Yeah. I think we're all, you know, more settled and moving forward, you know, in ways that I think are productive and healthy, you know, for myself and my children. But I would still say, you know, I'm very sad every day, still not in a way that, you know, has me, you know, that I can't get out of bed or, but there is a, there is a sadness that I carry that I think will, will shift and look different as life goes on, but it's definitely with me every day. And I'm, I'm still at times surprised by what will, how something will strike me and what will feel particularly sad Um, or, you know, just something ordinary in the day, a song will, I'll hear a song on the radio and that will evoke a memory, you know, that makes me sad or I, something comes to mind that just catches me a little off guard. And so I still have a lot of those experiences. And, and, you know, there's still all kinds of things like anger, you know, there's a sense of betrayal for me and what happened here. There's loneliness. There's a lot of different emotions. And it's been important for me to know that holding all of them is important. It's, it's, it's not just one or the other. It's not that one day I'm sad, one day I'm lonely, one day I'm angry. They're all there. Um, And being able to acknowledge and process through all of those has been really, uh, important and important part of the healing and moving forward. Mm. Well, we're going to talk some about emotions and being emotionally healthy. And to me, that's what you're describing that a very Mm -hmm. emotionally healthy person is someone who can look at all of those things together. Um, but I am wondering, I think back to, you know, the last time we talked, we talked about Darren's getting fired and what that meant for you. And I'm wondering if you look back at that and think, in some ways, God used that to prepare you for what was to come later. Do you think that's true? I absolutely do. I absolutely do. Um, I think it in some ways, you know, laid a foundation for me to understand what it looked like to have your life just absolutely come apart, you know, and to feel really unanchored and really unmoored. And um, yeah, I think it, I think it prepared me in a lot of ways for that. And I think it prepared me in just a deeper level of understanding my own um, emotional life and, and what it, what spiritual maturity means, what emotional maturity means, kind of how to have a more, you know, I would use the word integrated faith um, in some ways that just really involved all of those, all of those aspects. I think all of that prepared me in in many ways um, for what, you know, for his death in 2020, for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Darren was, pretty well-known person in the Mm -hmm. Christian world. And so I think, you know, a lot of times for me, when I think about people who are well-known, I think I kind of have an idea who that person is, or, Mm -hmm. you know, even the story of Darren, but you, you, of course, were the closest to him. So I would, 
before we, you know, move to the emotional health part, I would love for you to get to speak to who was Darren? What do you want us to mm-hmm. know and understand about him? Yeah. You know, I think that one thing I've really considered a lot is that, you know, there's so many gifts in the way that we have access to so many people. Now we, we know who so many people are throughout the world. There's a lot of gifts to that. There's also a lot of downsides to that. And I think one of them is that it becomes very easy to put people in some pretty small boxes and categories. And, uh, and I think our brain just kind of has to do that because we just can't catalog that many people. You know, it's just, we're trying to keep track somehow. Yeah. But I think what we lose in that is um, our humanity. Frankly, I think it's very easy to stop seeing people as human beings and, you know, there are some ways where I've had to, and and obviously this isn't what you're asking for, but I've had to sort of lay down any responsibility I feel to sort of explain Darren's life or, you know, wrap it all up and and put it in a box um, because I don't think that's my responsibility and I don't think it's appropriate. And he did a lot of that, you know, before his death for himself about his own story. But I think, I hope what we can do a better job of in general is, is remembering that the best any of us are, are human. That's it, you know, including our, including our pastors, which is not to say um, that we do not hold pastors to high standards, that we don't treat sin seriously, that we don't ask for integrity um, and expect that. But, you know, the godliest people we know, the people with the most integrity, we know the best that they are is very complex, complicated, wounded, broken in ways that we have, you know, no idea about. And I think we just have some questions to ask of ourselves about sometimes what we want our pastors and even our pastor's wives to be. And does that really go beyond the realm of what's reasonable to ask of any human being? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I hope we can, can look a little bit more deeply into that and move towards that more, even as our world keeps getting bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything that you would want us to know about you in that part of your life? You know, when you were a pastor's wife or when Darren was fired or Darren's death, anything you feel like you want to say about that? Yeah. I mean, I think in some ways it's the same thing, you know, that we're all just, we're all just, (laughs) we're all pretty complex, but, you know, I think something that happens a lot of times, um, to pastor's wives and even children, I would say, is that we start getting viewed as sort of an extension or an appendage of the pastor, for lack of a better word, as opposed to a human being in our own right. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's particularly true, you know, in stories like Darren's, you know, it's, I mean, these people have spouses and children, you know, fallen pastors have spouses and children. What, what's that like, you know? And so um, in some ways, I think it's, it's the same, it's the same thing. What I want, would want people to know about me. And that's not so much again, that I'm asking for, gosh, certainly not attention, <laughs> certainly not even affirmation, but I just, I hope that we can move closer to humanity um, mm. in the way that we look at both pastors and pastors' wives and the, and the way that we relate to them in general. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I do mm-hmm. want to talk about where you are now. You've learned a lot, I'm sure, about yeah. even more. I mean, you the, when we talked last, you had already learned a lot about emotional and mental health. You talked earlier about being an integrated person. Mm-hmm. What does what does it mean to be an integrated person? Yeah. So, you know, I think for a lot of us, and it took me a while to really see this about, about myself, but I had a primarily cognitive approach to my faith if I was being honest about it. And I think many of us have been taught to be uh, really skeptical about emotions, about Uh focusing too much on emotions. And I I completely understand where that comes from. Um, And I think it came out of a good place, honestly, and not wanting people to get caught up in something that wasn't, you know, all that healthy. But I I think there's been an overreach there, to, to say the least, because I think what it's become is not well, we shouldn't over, you know, we, not that we shouldn't over rely on emotions, but that emotions are bad in general and that we shouldn't really spend any time there. And so, and that I would say even blends into how we think about having a more embodied faith. 
and how that plays out in our physical bodies. Because anytime we have an emotional response to anything, something is happening in your body. Um, if you are angry, your heart rate's going to go up and your face may turn red. You know, if you are sad, you, tears will come without you being able to do anything about it. And so, um, you know, a lot of my approach to faith, if I'm honest, was that it was primarily theological, which I am, I am all for good and solid theology. Let's be biblically literate. But what it did in many ways was just sort of, it was a very narrow way uh, that I related to God. And it certainly wasn't conscious for me. And I don't think it's conscious for a lot of us, but it was really a way that I just didn't let God into many aspects of my life and my story. Um, I wasn't consciously saying, God, you don't have permission, but that's kind of what it amounted to. And so that's, you know, started to break down for me after a while when there were things happening emotionally um, and playing out in all kinds of ways that I really had not been taught how to integrate my theology with those things. Mm -hmm. I'm asking because I see this in myself that mm -hmm. you also did with your, with Darren, that Oh, for sure. It was hard to share on the emotional level because you're trying to kind of preach to yourself and preach to each other. And I don't know if that's what happened, but I see that in, in my life too. So I'm wondering how that affected your marriage relationship. Yeah, I think there were just things we didn't have categories for, and we didn't know how to see them that way. You know, it was, it was almost as if, you know, I had, I tried to solve most issues on a cognitive level, yeah. like on a belief level on, let's just change the way that we, you know, let's change the way that we believe about it or what we would say about it or let, and then that solves it, which obviously there are, there are parts of that that are true, you know, and, and what we believe is important and impacts all of those things. But there are other, there are other really important ways to acknowledge what's happening other than just on that cognitive piece, you know? Right. And I think what happens here is we, we, you know, we can say to someone, okay, well, don't be anxious, you know, Philippians four, six, and seven, don't be anxious. Okay. Well, how do we do that? <laughs> do we, you know, there's some, when I'm anxious there's something happening in my body physically before anything, before there's even a conscious thought in my head a lot of times. So how, what do we do with that? other than just in a cognitive kind of way. And so I think there were ways that Darren and I just missed each other and didn't know how to relate in that way because we didn't have categories for it. Yeah. You know, okay, well, you're kind of kind of throwing a temper tantrum right now. Well, don't do that. <laughs> Let's not be angry. Okay, well, where's that coming from? And what's that about? And why is that the way, you know, if we, we can pull weeds all day, uh, but until we dive into some of those things, I think we're never really going to see transformation. Yes. My husband and I talk about it like a, it's a room that's closed. It's a locked room and we don't want to go. The The locked room is the emotions and mm -hmm. we, we, the negative emotions, we don't want to yes. go and we don't know how to deal with those things. And so we got to keep that door locked and closed off and we got to make sure we don't go near that room. And yes. that affects every area of life eventually because yes. you're not living as a holistic person or an integrated person as you described. So can you give an example of what, what you would do now you're feeling anxious, you just described and your body's telling you that you recognize anxiety. What do you do as, as an emotionally healthy person? Yeah, well, I think acknowledging it, the first thing I don't that I don't do anymore is judge it, um, which is what I would have done first immediately, like, okay, you don't have to be, you know, just sort of, again, we're going to that cognitive place of let's just try to shut it down by judging it, which doesn't work real well, <laughs> for, for the most part. So acknowledging what that feels like, what's happening in emotionally, what's happening in my body, you know, in those circumstances, and then honestly, kind of there's some sitting with it that I think uh -huh. is necessary and just being able to be in it because it will pass, you know, knowing that it will pass. I think what's confusing about emotions a lot of times and the fear is that we're going to get stuck there and we will have no way out of that. I think as we become more emotionally agile people, we start to see that emotions will pass for the most part. Now, sometimes we can get stuck and need some help, you know, in some other ways, but I can kind of be there, acknowledge what's going on, acknowledge why it is, do some things like 
you know, take some deep breaths and, and do some, I have some strategies that I know will work for me in that situation and let it pass because it does. And so, but I think that's a learned process over time that takes a lot of practice. Mm -hmm. The alternative though is, you know, you sort of start building your life around the locked room, you know, to go back to your analogy, you know, I love the phrase, it's not mine, but the things that we disown will end up owning us, you know? Mm -hmm. And so for a lot of us, those negative emotions, we think we are ignoring them or not going there, but they are ruling the day in one way or another. It's sort of like this thing in the center of our life that we just march around all the time and build life around and work around. Um, that I, I don't want to do that. You know, that's the alternative. And I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. Cause it's kind of like a body that has a, a part that's, we have not built muscle or we haven't used, we adjust, we, uh, we yes. adjust ourselves, but it ends up making the other body body parts, not healthy and yes. we become a dysfunctional person. in in, in other words, Yes. Yes. So putting this together for those in ministry, I want to ask about Mm -hmm. that. What you, I've heard you say that you're really passionate about talking about these things in the scope of ministry, talking to pastors, talking to pastor's wives. So what have you learned that you really want pastors to know? Well, you know, part of it, I think is what I just, what I just said is that I think a lot of us you know, I think this is an underdeveloped area for many of us uh, because of a heavy, you know, theological and cognitive emphasis for many of us. So I think it is an area of weakness that we, that we need to consider. Um, And I think the sooner we can consider it, the better um, before things really start, you know, falling apart um, in some ways. So I think when we start to notice, you know, sometimes the way that emotional health stuff shows up, honestly, is with physical stuff. Um, I know for Darren, there were a number, he ended up with a number of autoimmune issues, just a lot of pain in general, sleep issues. So sometimes these things start, you know, showing up in that area on those kinds of areas, but paying attention to what is happening kind of on that emotional level. Is it anxiety? Is it, are we exhausted? Are we, um, angrier than we've been before. And we don't really know why irritable, you know, those things are all signs that that something's going on. And often what's going on is, you know, the batteries are running out on the strategies that we've used um, thus far to kind of make it. And particularly after coming out of a global pandemic, my goodness, like talk about strategies that don't work well anymore. I think anyone in ministry is just goodness the amount of stress and pressure and having to revamp every strategy um, is a significant reality. And so, you know, I think paying attention to some of these kinds of things before things really get more serious, um, but we have to have a category for it, you know, Mm -hmm. other than that, that's just be, that's not just behavioral or something that we're going to fix by thinking differently about it. Yes. So true. And I'm sure you would say the same to pastor's wife. I said just pastors, but I think that it applies to pastor's wives as well. But sometimes, you know, hearing this and we know, we know we're a holistic person. We know we need to pay attention to these things, but implementing it in, in ministry can be really difficult because mm-hmm. pastors and pastor's wives are carrying everyone else's stuff. So how, how would yeah. you suggest making emotional health a priority when you're dealing with everyone else's emotional and you know, physical and circumstantial issues. Yeah. I think a lot of it has to do with, um, paying attention. You know, I think in ministry, we often just stop paying attention to what's going on with us because we're so busy paying attention to everyone else, you know, because that's what's expected. And, um, no one means to do that. Uh, but we just sort of, we sort of fall asleep to ourselves often until something really forces us to wake up. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, obviously we could talk about the importance of Sabbath and sabbatical and many of those types of things, which even as I say them, I am recognizing the challenge in those, you know, how do you have a Sabbath every week when you know what you're doing on Sunday? And then you have children who have activities on Saturday and you have one day off. I mean, how, how this is messy, this is complicated. And so, I always preface any con- any conversation about a Sabbath or sabbatical or even rest with no judgment here because it's really hard. These are really hard things to figure out. But even if it's finding small 
pockets of time where you can just be quiet and sort of with the Lord, check in with yourself about, about what's going on and with your spouse and, and develop a greater awareness um, of what these things look like. I think that's a first step for sure. Mm -hmm. One thing that this sounds so, you know, infantile, but one thing my husband and I have incorporated in the past year is a feelings wheel. <laughs> yes. Is I love it. Breaking out the feelings <laughs> wheel. We have it on our phone, you know, saved in photos or whatever. And when he comes home from work, he stops before he comes in and he gets out his feelings wheel and he's, uh, he picks out two words because what happens is he usually, what we, this, the reason why we started doing this is because he would come home and we would, of course, go through the litany of all the things like this is what I did today. And then it turns into the problems of the day and you don't ever talk about, well, how are you feeling about that? And yes. so we start with the feeling and that has been really, really a monumental change. It sounds so silly and simple, but to, for him to say, I feel, you know, sad, or I feel nervous about whatever. And then I can ask questions, but it puts us at a connection level versus a schedule conversation. Yes. Absolutely. I think that is a beautiful strategy. And I think the other thing it does, you know, for a lot of us, certain emotions are easier to access than others. And so when we don't name things like that, you know, for a lot of us, anger is easier. Anger is easier and quicker than saying I'm sad or saying yeah. I'm afraid or whatever it might be. And so then, then it gets very confusing when anger is coming out, but it's really disproportionate to what's happening, <laughs> you know, in the situation. And so then it's, is this really anger? Maybe not. There's something, maybe there's something else going on, you know, underneath the surface here that's harder to acknowledge. And so any kind of tool like that, where we can acknowledge it. And then as you just said, so beautifully, the goal here is connection. You know, we're connecting with each other. We're connecting with God in that way. It's not just about naming the emotion. It's, it's the connection that comes out of that, I think is really yes. where we're trying to go. Yeah. Because it requires vulnerability. And Absolutely. I love, I love that you brought it, God back into the picture, because I do yes. think it's also changed how I relate to God that I can, sometimes when I feel unsettled, I have to stop and think, why do I feel unsettled? And then I can say to God, the emotion I feel, I feel yes. unsettled because I'm really anxious about this, or yes. I feel really lonely or sad. And just acknowledging it to God also connects me to him and allows Absolutely. him to speak into the situation with the truth of his word. So it brings it to the cognitive at some point, the truth, right? But I have to be able to, and you know, I would say learning the skill even of lament to, yes. to be able to take that to God and not feel that that's wrong. I think sometimes we yes. feel like it's wrong to feel these things, but it's, it's the human experience and scripture gives yes. us language for it. Right. Yes. And I would argue that if you look at the gospels, you can see Jesus demonstrating many, if not all of the primary emotions, you know, and I think we, we, we look past Jesus humanity a lot of times in that, you know, I, I often find myself reading, reading the Bible in general, but reading any story in kind of an emotionally cold kind of way. And I, it's been an interesting experience to look back at that and say, wait a minute, what did it look like? What was it like for Jesus to be angry? You know, what Jesus wept, it's the shortest verse in the Bible, but putting yourself, imagine Jesus weeping, you know, and mm -hmm. he, he is the model. He's the model for these things. He mm -hmm. experienced all of those things, you know? And so yes, relating to God on, on an emotional level is it's a huge part of our faith. And I think we're missing an enormous portion of it when we don't go there with him. Yeah. I think it's an invitation. I think it's an invitation to more of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's what we, my husband says. It's an invitation to life. It's yes. an invitation to life. Even the sad, even the ones we term negative, even though we've started to talk about them, <laughs> I'm using quotes. You, no one can see me, but even the <laughs> negative emotions, those are given by God. So they're not really right. negative. They're right. They're a part of our experience and we don't like them, but God gives us those emotions for a reason. So absolutely. 
Can you speak to the importance of boundaries when it comes for pastors and pastors wives, when it comes to our emotional health? Because that's really what you're saying is we have to take time. We have to kind of put some fences around ourselves and remember we're real people. So, right. so what would you say about boundaries? Yeah, I think it's such an important topic for pastors and pastors' wives. Um, it's an important topic for everyone, but particularly in either of those roles, because it one, because it's tricky, <laughs> but two, because it's it's really important. Um, you know, I I think more recently, particularly when it comes to pastors' wives, um, but I'll speak to it to pastors too. I think pastors' wives need a job description for themselves um, that they and their spouse have agreed upon. And I would even argue that you have discussed and that has been affirmed by the leaders and the elders in your church. Mm. Um, I'm going to say that the pastor needs it too. I, I, I mean, maybe not, but you'd probably be shocked at the amount of pastors I know who don't have a job description. But what happens, I think, to both pastors and pastor's wives is that the job description is unspoken, but it's everything. It, it requires everything. I, you know, when we planted a church, I, I, I naively thought that I wouldn't really deal with expectations as much from other people because I didn't have a predecessor, you know, because I was, oh. there wasn't someone that came before me and, you know, bless my heart. In, in <laughs> Because, you know, no one means to, but anyone who'd been in a church had ideas of what a pastor's wife was, you know, unchurched people, we had a lot of unchurched people, they had ideas, too, you know, um, and no one means to, for the most part, project those onto you, but that's absolutely what happens. And so, you know, the biggest piece about boundaries to me is that you are clear on, this is my role, this is what it is, and this is what it isn't, and it reflects my season of life, my gifts, my strengths, um, maybe some preferences of what I want to do and what I don't want to do. And that there is agreement on that because a lot of what happens to us is we, we want to help people. We, yeah. we want to be whatever people need us to be. We can't possibly be all those things. And so, you know, if we don't know what it is, it's, it's impossible to communicate that to everyone else. I think it's just such a, an easy preventative way to just help us be on the same page. You know, even when it comes to something like we say, okay, the pastor's wife is going to pour into the elder's wives. Okay. That's language that I would hear a lot of times. She's going to disciple. She's going to pour into the elder's wives. Okay. Well, let's break down what pour into means. That could mean a thousand different things. How many elder's wives do you have? Do you have five? Do you have seven? Does that mean coffee once a week? Does that mean a Bible study once a week? If we don't define any of these things, then we're sort of pulled around by many people's expectations of, of what that could be. And then there's a lot of hard conversations and all kinds of things. And it, you just have no room, I think, to create space for yourself to be healthy um, and, and mature in all the ways that that, all the things that that means. So anyway, that is a, a practical thing that I recommend more often than not um, these days for both pastors and pastor's wives. And not many people are doing it. I, I will say that it's, it's not, that's not common. I don't yeah. think, but I think we need to make it more common. I think it would save us a lot of pain and heartache and confusion and just help us to all be healthier in general. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. I have never thought of that before. And mm -hmm. I love that you mm -hmm. said it. Because I, for me, it's, I spend a lot of time ruminating on well, what should I be doing? What, you know, what, what do the elders wives expect me to do in terms of whatever? And I try to just make it up in my head. And I just love that. Yes. So thank you. Well, and I day. know personally in my own experience, it just, I didn't know I had permission to have those conversations, you know, even to say, Hey, like, what does this mean <laughs> for me? And and, and, and giving me permission to say, I just can't do that right now. And honestly, for some pastor's wives, the job description might be, I have two small children and I am showing up at church on Sunday and that's about it. That's right. <laughs> because that's about all I can do right now. But even knowing that is helpful. So helpful across the board. Yes. So good. I know that there are <laughs> women who are listening, who are facing challenges at home in their marriage. Mm -hmm. and they are bringing their concerns to their husband, but he is overwhelmed, stressed out, 
potentially not listening to her concerns. And I've been in this situation before, Amy, and I have thought, sure. where do I go? I can't go right. to the pastor like everyone else because I'm living with the pastor and he, I feel is the problem. <laughs> right. And of course it's not always him. Who's the problem. Sometimes it's me, but what would you say to a wife in that kind of situation? Yeah, I think it's really important um, for pastor's wives, whether it's, whether it's a marriage situation, like you're talking about, whether it's issues in the church that they don't feel like they have anyone perhaps mm-hmm. besides their husband who they can talk to. We really need some neutral third party kind of people in our life who can kind of stand outside and objectively look at, look at a situation um, and give us some help um, yeah. and who are not right in the middle of it, you know, with us. Yeah. So whether yeah. that's a counselor, whether that's a mentor of some kind, um, it's probably going to need to be somebody outside your church, honestly, for the, for the most part, even if, and I, I know, even as I say those things, these things cost money. And I know we all don't have, you know, all the money to spend on those things. So even if it's someone who's not a professional, but who's a mentor couple, a little bit ahead of you, you know, for a marriage situation that perhaps you and your husband could agree on to just, can we just talk to them? Or if your husband can't go there yet, or isn't willing, can you just talk, you know, to that person just to have a place where you feel seen and loved and safe, you know, Mm -hmm. to talk about those things is important. And, and if you don't have those people in your life, I think that is a daily prayer request that God would bring you somebody. Um, There's some looking to do. Like, I feel like we have to be proactive in, in trying to locate who those people might be, but also just asking God to send someone that way um, to at least have, you know, start some of those conversations where we at least have a place to process. Yes. Basically we need people who are not dependent upon our success or yes. failure in ministry that yes. they don't necessarily need us to stay in that spot or need us to, uh, you know, our well being. Do anything. Right, yeah. right, right. Like it needs to be somebody who could say, it's time to go. Or, yeah. you know, you need to do this or that, but it, they're not concerned about their own well being because it's not their, we're not their pastor and pastor's wife, for example. Yes. They are able to stay, I would call it staying differentiated from your situation um, because they're not invested in it in a way that costs them in any way. And, and you know, that could even be, you know, you can get attached to people for all kinds of reasons, you know, and some of us, some people are just attached to pastors or pastors, wives being a certain way or having a certain, even if they're not in your church. Um, and that, that won't work. They, it needs to be more objective, um, than that, but also kind, you know, there is, there's a, sometimes the term gets used around this. You need someone who's not impressed with you. And I, Mm. I agree with that. I I do feel like there's a little bit of snark in that, that I don't love, (laughs) you know, because there needs to be a kindness um, and a genuine empathy and care for you. um, That is objective, but also is it so isn't this kind of, well, I'm just not impressed with you kind of detached um, kind of relationship. Right. They want your well being as a Christian and as a human being. Right. Yes. So what about the pastor's wife who's listening, who has concerns about her husband's mental or emotional well-being? What would you say to her, Amy? Yeah. So, you know, part of what I already said, I think is really important in that um, sometimes I don't even know if we know what we're looking for in Mm. that before it gets really significant. I think we all know things like, you know, my husband, you know, if it was my husband is, is having suicidal thoughts. My husband can't get out of bed, my, you know, like those kinds of things are more clear. Um, but I think the warning signs are way earlier than that. Some of it I've already talked about as far as physical things, irritability. Um, but what's often happening is things are showing up, you know, relationally. Um, you may see some things happening at home, but often what's happening is in ministry context, things are kind of relationally going off the rails. What I advocate for is, and, and I advocate for it because this is not my experience, um, and I think it's really important, is cultivating a relationship with your elders or leaders um, so that if there are concerns 
about your husband, the pastor's overall health and well-being, you are brought into those conversations. I think it's hugely important. I think it rarely happens. My argument um, when Darren was fired was not that he should not have been fired. My argument was if I had known what was going on, I would have pulled him out myself two years earlier um, because there was never a conversation that happened with me. I was never brought into a conversation about those concerns. And more concerning was that when I talked to, you know, the primary leader in our church planning network about this after the fact, you know, his response to me was, I don't know. I don't know if I would pull a wife into those conversations or not, which I was horrified, <laughs> frankly, um, because then that helped me see, okay, this isn't just our church. This is a this is a problem in, in a lot of places now. Um, and I realize that there are a lot of dynamics to those relationships um, and that can be a messy conversation. And yeah. that I recognize as I'm saying this, that would be a scary place. Um, that would be a scary thing to do because unfortunately in some, in some churches, the moment we go there, the categories are, is this disqualifying or not? Those yeah. are the only categories we have. So what I'm advocating for is getting way ahead of things to where we're having conversations way ahead of the point of someone is completely burnt out and can't get out of bed. Someone's had a moral failure. Someone is just off the rails relationally entirely. Can we have categories, which again goes back to this emotional health discussion ahead of time? And can we foster a relationship here um, where our leaders know no one's going to be more impacted um, if things go badly here than the pastor's wife and his kids. Yes. And so let's pull her in to this conversation and get ahead of this um, before things go you know, much worse than they need to. And because the pastor's wife also needs pastoring, yes. you know, like her yes. husband cannot be her pastor and all things. And she needs pastoring from the elders. So that's yes, really what you're saying is that we need a culture where everyone is yes. cared for and pastored. Yes. And I would say, you know, hopefully if that kind of situation was happening with any member of the church, a spouse would be pulled in male or female, a spouse would be pulled into that conversation. And so if the pastor's wife is a member of the church, and she should at least, you know, get that same kind of pastoring um, in that situation. But it often does not happen. Um, and that is profoundly concerning to me for pastors' wives, for women in general, for marriages, for just people in general um, and how we pastor and how we care for people in our churches. Yes, I am amening so much, <laughs> but thank you for saying that. And thank you for advocating for that. I know pastors wives listening are also <laughs> nodding their head along with you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Amy. Um, mm -hmm. So you're no longer a pastor's wife. And right. I really like getting to talk to women and ask this question of women who have made a transition in their lives. And obviously this was not a transition that you chose, mm -hmm. but can you tell us now that you look back at your quote unquote previous life as a pastor's wife, what, what would you go back and tell yourself? Hmm. So many things. <laughs> uh, so many things, you know, there's so many things you see more objectively after standing outside of something, you know, for a, a significant period of time. Um, the preface for me is I loved being a pastor's wife. I loved it. Um, I still look back with great fondness on, you know, every aspect of that from youth ministry to, you know, planning a church to all, to all of those pieces. So um, I loved that life. I look back and see now more clearly the enormous amount of pressure that I was under in all those situations that I just sort of discounted because I, you know, how you just plow through, you know, particularly church planners wives, we just plow through it. We just, <laughs> we just figure it out and keep going, but an enormous amount of pressure and gosh, I was just trying so hard, you know, in, I was just trying so hard to do the right thing. And so to pastors wives, you know, I, I want to say, I see you because I, Sometimes I don't even think we acknowledge, we can acknowledge how hard we're trying, you know, and um, I see you pastor's wives that you are trying really hard. Um, every, almost every pastor's wives I, I know, I'd have to say is just really trying. But I would also say, you know, I, I've definitely had some significant shifts um, 
and how and how I would want to do ministry and how I want, want to see things go, you know, after the fact. And and I don't mean that at all. I know a lot of times when people say that they've really taken a theological shift away from orthodoxy. And that is not all at all what I'm saying. You know, after Darren was fired, particularly, um, you know, what I can say about that situation is that I think that every pastor's wife has thought about what it would look like if if things were to blow up for my husband and his life in our church, um, because it's it's all over the place. And so we think about it. And in my case, I can say that the way I thought it would go was not at all how it ended up going. Um and I mostly mean that from a relational perspective, um, as far as how I thought kind of our leadership would handle that relationally, um, our church planning network, you know, even just relationships, colleagues, ministry friends um, that I'd had forever. There was a massive um, relational exodus for us is, is the best way that I can say that. Um, people I called friends for years that I have never heard from again. Um, ever. Um, organizations that I taught for, wrote for, um, you know, all of those things that I never heard a word from, you know, people I thought that would have my back. And I, I by no, I in no way mean um, discounting sin or not taking sin seriously, but that could at least, you know, send a text and say, we love you and we're praying for you in your corner. And so, you know, it was it was a massive shift to me when many of the people who had, had preached grace the loudest to me and had preached the gospel the loudest to me thought the the approach was to leave us in the corner by ourselves. And it was even more confusing after Darren died when people reached out to me then who I hadn't heard from at all, you know, in the past five years. So, you know, for me, considering what grace means relationally and what the gospel means relationally has been really important in light of what I've lived. Um, And obviously there's been a lot of forgiveness needed, you know, on my end and a lot of working things out relationally where I could, but if grace isn't relational, I don't know what it is. And, and I think sometimes our, our theology gets in our way or we don't quite know how to live it out um, in this area. And I've seen, a massive, um, I, I don't know what to call it other than a big problem there. Um, and something that I would not want to do in the future or model, or I would not want to care or love people, care for or love people in that way. And so, you know, there's certainly been some shifts for me not being a pastor's wife anymore, but I think as painful as that has all been, it's, it's given me a lot of clarity um, for what's important to me moving forward and what I really want to advocate for and how I want to care for and love people, particularly leaders in the ministry um, oh. going forward. So in that way, I'm incredibly grateful if I had to be the one to, to live through that pain um, so that I can be the one to say something about it, then, okay, I, I will take that. Um, mm. But I wouldn't want it for anybody else for sure. Yeah. I don't even know what to say. I'm really sorry that that happened. I'm sorry just for the loss that you've, you've endured, you know, not even just Darren's death, but the, the firing and the loss of relationship and Mm -hmm. just so much. I have to ask you how there is not a drip of bitterness in your voice. Hmm. How have you gotten (laughs) to that point? A, A lot of help. I've had help from a lot of great people who've really walked me through a lot of that, who have let me tell all my stories, you know, that I couldn't yeah. uh, tell, who have let me repeatedly tell stories that where I've said, I just can't believe this happened, you know, and they've let me repeatedly, you know, work through that. You know, it's a, uh, it's forgiveness. My goodness is a, is an, a long ongoing process, but, you know, I also can look at it and say, gosh, there were, there were holes for me and the, there were, there were gaps for me in the way that I approached my faith. A lot of what we've talked about here, sort of that overly cognitive, you know, not as aware of emotions. I mean, I, I don't think even the people who really just left us behind, I don't think it was intentional in any way, but we, we just all have some gaps there, you know, and, and we, sometimes we don't know what we don't know until we know, you know? Yeah. And so, for me, I, I've definitely had to look back and say, gosh, I've probably done that to people as well at times without, without meaning to. And sometimes there are things we just don't know, you know, until we know. And so that's given me more grace, but 
believe me, I've had angry, 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 bitter moments. <laughs> I've had to spend a lot of time with the Lord and with really gracious, caring people who've helped me through that one a lot. Mm-hmm. Well, he's definitely been good to you and helping you with all of yes. these things. I hope that's an encouragement yes, to you to yeah. have a moment to say, okay, look at where God's brought me um, yeah. today. So yeah. you've mentioned advocating for several things. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I, I asked you to come on because I heard you say that I wanted to hear what you had to say. So where can we find you? Where, what are you doing to advocate for these things? Uh, Well, a a lot of that is just emerging, you know, for me, uh, I would say I'm doing some work, quite a bit of work with a ministry um, out of Louisville called Crosspoint, who is all about caring for the souls of leaders and, um, cultivating healthy relationships. They have been a huge part of my story. Um, and both Darren and my story, just, they were probably the one part of our restoration process that was helpful. (laughs) Helpful isn't even the right word. Transformative. They, Mm. They were absolutely transformative for us, mostly because not mostly, but the place they started was they just, they saw us and they loved us in our worst, in our, in our very worst moments. Um, so I'm glad to be doing, you know, some work with them and, um, and just spending time with, with Christian leaders, you know, as I can growing into what that's going to look like for me as I move forward, but it's certainly what I'm passionate about and, um, what I hope to spend most of my time doing. I'm so grateful for your work in that your willingness to speak, your willingness to join me and to talk about painful, difficult things because we need, we need that. We need people like you, we meaning pastors and pastors wives, we need people like you helping us to see these things. So thank you, Amy, so much for being Mm. willing to talk with me today. Absolutely. Well, and I'm, I'm so grateful for your voice, Christine, and um, just how you have always really showed up for pastors wives and uh, have really just tried to be a safe place there. And I think you are. And so thank you for what you do as well. Thank you. I'm so grateful to Amy for entrusting her story to me. And I am grateful to you for listening to By Faith. Friends, as always, you can find resources and links to anything mentioned in the episode in the show notes on your podcast platform or on my website, christinehoover.net. We've spent time this week on emotional and relational health. Join me next week as I talk with Tristy Fisher about spiritual health. Tristy is a friend of mine and a pastor's wife serving in College Station, Texas. She is so passionate about the word and about Jesus, which you will hear in her voice in our conversation next week. And she joins me to help us understand how we can thrive in our relationship with God as we lead and pour out in the lives of others. You're going to love Tristy. Until then, friends, have a great week and keep walking forward by faith.